Distance change with broken strings and worn out souls. Heels of gold and some with wings. Some are old, some under soul. To grow, we need to rely on and try on some other people's shoes. Some other people's Welcome in to Other People's Shoes. Of course, you know who I am. I am your host, Neil Matthews. Thank you so much for joining us. It is a new year. It is a new season. And uh, with that, we probably have in my mind a, a lady that uh, that really needs a fanfare or maybe a red carpet introduction. So I'm going to do my best here. She, of course, is a New York Times bestselling author. She's the recipient recipient of the Margaret A. Edwards Award uh, for uh, significance and long uh, longest contributing to uh, writing for teenagers. She has received the uh, Coretta Scott King Award for both uh, Copper Sun and Forgotten by Fire. Forged by Fire, excuse me, Forged by Fire. I'll get, I'll get that right. So there we are. And um, she is, of course, the award. Uh, she's been awarded the uh, Charlotte Hook Award for uh, Stella by Starlight, which is a good book. I would recommend that one. But the one that I'm most excited about is this one here, and that's this, is uh, her book, Out of My Mind, won multiple awards, and it should have, and probably lots more to come, has been on the New York Times bestseller list for over three years. It is currently number three on the middle school paperback list. Uh, it has been translated, this is fascinating, translated in over 20 different languages and probably needs to be translated in a whole lot more, in my opinion. This is just such a great book. Uh, was once uh, Time Magazine's most influential books of all time, and I have a hard time believing it should have been higher on that list because this book is powerful. Any of it, we'll keep going. Her most recent book, uh, Blended, is also on New York Times bestseller list. Chronicles uh, a young girl with uh, biracial, who's biracial, who struggles to define her identity. We'll talk about that here more in a moment. And a uh, uh, and has some personality and uh, just some, some real challenges. Uh, it is Publishers Weekly's uh, Blend has been uh, starred as, a, as an award-winning book. It's timeless. By the way, my guest resides in Cincinnati, Ohio. Sorry, Bengals fans. Sorry, but she's a winner where you are. So there we are. Uh, she's taught high school English for 25 years. Uh, she's been named uh, National Teacher of the Year, not just regional, but National Teacher of the Year. To learn more about her, you can, of course, visit her website, uh, SharonDraper.com. It is with great pleasure I welcome my guest, Sharon Draper. Sharon, how are you? What an introduction. I know I messed up a lot, and I apologize, but there we well, are. Good, mo good morning. I'm delighted to be here. You are, and and I've heard some interviews with you. You are a delight, if I may say so myself. Well, thank you, thank yeah. you. I love to I love to talk to people, so yeah, I'm I try, I try to be easy to talk to. Well, so you can ask me anything you want. I I love to hear that. And Sharon, uh, I got to get this out of the way first. Two things I got to get out of the way first. First, our, our most important question. Then I want to lead into a little bit of story on how I found you. So so here's the most important question you're probably ever going to answer on the show. I'm laughing, of course, when I say this because everyone answers it, and that's this. Uh, Sharon, what shoe size do you wear? Seven and a half to eight. Okay. And then is there a certain brand or style that you like more than another? Um, I have, I, I used to wear heels a lot, but now I wear flat, comfy shoes and uh, mostly sneakers and tennis shoes and um, because I do a lot of walking in airports and I found that it's much more sensible to walk through an airport airport in uh, good looking tennis shoes than fancy shoes. Do you have a certain brand that you prefer as far as the tennis shoes go? Uh, actually, I do. I can't remember the name of it. <laughs> um, I have to let me I, I can look it up. Give me two seconds yeah. and I will tell you. It is. Dun, 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 drum roll. Drum roll, please. And she looks for, it's Allbirds. Allbirds. Okay. Allbirds. Never heard of that brand before, and but that's okay. They make the most comfortable shoes on the face of the earth. Hmm. I'm going to have to look into so, that, being a shoe guy so, myself. I so embarrass my... I embarrassingly there, say all the time that I have over 50 pairs of shoes, so I'm uh, kind of a shoe nut. If, if so. you try one pair of all birds, you will never buy anything else. And so now we've given them all this free advertisement. We are. The shoes 
are allbirds.com. I'm guessing maybe maybe that's not their domain, but I'm going to go buy just in case. Probably, but but truly, they're the most comfortable sneakers I have ever worn in my life. I have about four pair of them. That's awesome. So, uh, so Sharon, here's my story on how I, how I met you or how we kind of cross paths. So I always like to tell people kind of the background story. So I am always on the hunt for a good guest. Uh, Garrett and I work very diligently to find good people, good stories, much like you as a writer. I'm sure you always look for, you know, good themes, good inspiration. And we'll get into that hopefully a little bit later, but, but here's my story on you. So I'm at my, uh, my work one day, my, my normal job, and I get a text from my wife, which is not uncommon. And she sends me a screenshot of uh, Out of My Mind, uh, the book cover with the goldfish uh, jumping out of the bowl. Mm-hmm. And and she says, you ought to get this lady on your show. She has a great book called Out of My Mind, a great story about empathy, great story about really being in someone else's shoes. Totally fits into the theme of really what our shoe is, uh, our shoe, our shoe, our show is after. There we go. Trying to get that word out. And <laughs> so she sends me this thing. And, and so I immediately jump on Google and I, I did ad- admittedly, uh, uh, admitting it now, I did Google you. And I started reading about, you know, you and your website and, and all of that. And that, by the way, is uh, SharonDraper.com, in case you're wondering. And I know you know that, but those <laughs> listening may not remember. But I start reading reading about you and I'm like, man, I, I guess I got to go read this story. And so I, I did. I powered through out of my mind. I listened to it on audio so I could get through it uh, so much faster. First off. Great story, wonderful story. Everyone needs to go read that. But second thing that comes to my mind is I'm like, I really got to get this lady on my show. I really, I, I, you know, I don't know how I'm going to do that. So I go to your website, I find an email and I send one. And I'm thinking, okay, well, here we go. Another email that I send out to somebody that I think, am I ever going to get a response from? And almost instantaneous, I think it was either that day or maybe even a little later in the day, I do get a response. And I'm so pleasantly surprised uh, to get a response because let's face it, you're a busy lady. You're an author, you're traveling, you're, you're, you know, you have speaking engagements, you have, you know, all the stuff that, that, that is in Sharon's world, but you still took the time to write to us and write us back and say that you wanted to come on. And we're just tickled pink to, to have you come on and to not only have you share your story, but of course, talk about your passion, which is writing and, and, and these books. So I got to tell oh, you, my wife gets all the credit in the world <laughs> to, well, tell uh, to your connect wife us I said, together. Tell her I said thank you, and I'm delighted to be here. So there we are. So we're excited by that. So um, so going back into um, to Out of My Mind, I did have a question for you on that. So how on earth did you so eloquently put yourself quite literally in uh, Melanie, which is the key character in your Melody. Story? Melody. Thank you for the Melody. Question. I Melody. gave her that name because it's a beautiful name. And I just put and, it. And she didn't have a beautiful life. So I gave right. her a beautiful name. I did that on purpose. And also because she loved music so much mm. and music was important in her life and um, so I tried to make the writing of it even feel musical as I was doing it. I didn't know it ahead of time, but as you put nuances in, you you add musicality to the story. So I named her Melody on purpose. Well, I got to be honest with you. I never even made that correlation to you just said that just now, that that is so fitting of her name. And I don't want to give too much of the story away because I really want people to go listen to it and uh, not only listen to it, but read it, read it while listening to it, maybe even... But but I never even put that together until just now. So that that is a nuance I didn't even catch. So that's awesome. But but how did you so eloquently put yourself into her her place, so to speak? Well, when you decide on a character, you you have to say, okay, how am I going to get into the world of this character? I have a lot of experience working with uh, people with disabilities. When I was in high school, I used to work at a summer camp every summer, where um, and where you learned that uh, when you're rolling a wheelchair, you have to go backwards down a hill, not forwards down a hill. Because if you go forwards, the person in the wheelchair is likely to go whoop de woof and go rolling down the hill head first. So, you know, you learn things like that. And uh, I do have members of my family that have disabilities, as everybody does. When I talk to students at school, I say, how many of you wear glasses? And half of them raise their hand. And I, I raise my hand with them. I said, I do, too. I said, that's a disability. Because those of us that don't need glasses can see, you know. And those of us that do need glasses need some help. And so Melody is a character who needs 
way more help than the average person. But when you think about it in the whole scope of how we cope uh, with each other in the world, Melody is just one little girl trying to make her voice be heard, which is difficult because she can't talk. Well, and I think that's what's so fascinating to me about the story in general is just I really felt like this is almost like I'm reading someone's diary diary in a lot of respects. Uh, I I just thought you did such a great job with that. And I'm, I'm just, uh, again, I, I think people need to go out and, you know, read it. And uh, if you haven't yet, you know, if I haven't said it enough times, it's really important to go read it. So there we are. <laughs> so, uh, so Sharon, where do you get your greatest source of, of just inspiration? Where does that come from? Uh, it depends. It just kind of comes to me. Ideas kind of boil in the back of my head and it's like a a teapot percolating in the back of my head and it gradually comes to a boil and moves forward. So um, I have ideas for stories long before I write them. For instance, I have a stack of about 25 books in my office that I keep stumbling over, uh, left over from when I went to Egypt. And I'm going to write a story about a girl from Egypt, but that's down the line. I can't do that yet, but it's percolating in the back of my head. But out of my mind uh, was the book that emerged that year, and I I needed to tell the story of this this girl who had so much to say, but no way to say it. And the book has had such a surprising effect on so many people around the world um, where I've had I've had uh, teachers say I've worked with kids in the special needs class for years it never occurred to me that they had thoughts in their head that they couldn't get out and so I gave those kids a voice well and again I, I think that just speaks so much about your ability to communicate that and having that experience and to help, you know, helping give a voice, uh, to, to folks. I know there was a, there was a, uh, I think you were at a school maybe in North Carolina and again, correct me if I'm wrong geographically, but there was a young lady who introduced you at maybe a book fair or or a book event. Yes. And she had uh, a very similar, uh, device that, uh, Melody uses in the, in the book. And I thought that was exceptional. She probably did a way better job introducing you than I did, but, uh, but nonetheless, I I thought that was kind of cool, uh, to see that and and to see that kind of, um, you know, firsthand and to really visually help me kind of understand the talking board. So that was pretty cool too. So I got to, I'm, I'm curious about this too. I came across this and, and you'll probably recognize this because it's on your site. Uh, but you say, uh, I approach the world with the eyes of an artist, with the ears of a musician, with the soul of a writer. I see rainbows where others see rain and possibilities when others see problems. Why should everyone have that worldview? Do you think? I don't think everybody should. That's I'm only describing myself. I can't, you know, say what other how other people should view the world. But I try to look at the world very positively. I I focus, I love sunshine. I love warm weather. I love going outside and the warm breezes. I love going to the beach. That's just my personal preferences. Um, and so when I write, I try to infuse my stories with the kind of imagery that makes me happy. Uh, I write by a window. So whatever the weather is ends up being in the book. So if it's a snowy day, then the chapter is going to end up in the wintertime. Or if the leaves are falling and I'm looking at the beautiful colors of the leaves, then that may make its way into a story. So I'm very uh, heavily laden with, artistic uh, sensibilities. Not on purpose, it's just in there. So you don't think people should have that worldview? I'm, I'm, I'm not, troubled by that. No, I'm not saying that people should have that worldview. I can only speak for myself. That's my worldview. I see the world uh, as blue skies and shun- sunshine and rainbows, but I can't say that everybody else should. What I write, I want them to read what I write so that they can see 
my vision and they can see the vision of the characters of what this character might be thinking or what this character might be seeing. So um, I just put my own sensibilities into the story and build it into characters that I create. I love it. I love it a lot, actually. Uh, Garrett is over here, like, yesing and high-fiving, and it's, <laughs> it's quite hilarious to see. I wish you could see it. Uh, what was the hardest book for you to write? Copper Sun. Um, Copper Sun takes place in Africa. Well, it starts in Africa. And it started because of my first trip to Africa. I've been to Africa several times, and I love it, love it, love it. And um, people in the United States... Um, think Africa is one place, you know, Africa is many, many different countries. And um, I went to Ghana and spent, I went several times and I love the, again, (laughs) the sensibilities, the air, the smoky air, the, 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 the heat, the, the trees, the flowers, the fruit, all of that you know, is infused into the book because I enjoy being there so much. And I spent time with the people. I spent time in the villages so that I could make it real. And then um, what I wanted to do was explain what it felt like to be a regular teenage girl, just like all of the zillions of teenagers today, except you're, the year is 1738 you live in Ghana and your family is destroyed. Everybody in your family is destroyed and you are taken as a slave and put on a ship and go to and taken to a country that you know nothing about. You don't, you know, nothing about the, the people, the culture, the language, nothing. And you are a prisoner and you're 15 years old. So Copper Sun emerged from my various trips to Africa and my need to explain how it felt to be just one slave. And then you multiply that by millions and millions. Wow. I'm going to have to go read that one. Yeah. I mean, you had me intrigued just by that. I mean, yeah. So, so I was doing my math too. You, I mean, you grew up in an era where, you know, the civil rights movement's going on, right? Yes. What, what was that experience like? And has that experience led into your writing at all? That's the book I'm writing now. So I can't talk about it. <laughs> but, <yep. laughs> that all is right, the book that is sitting on my computer right now okay. with a, uh, where I stopped at a comma and said, okay, I'll get back to this. But yeah, I'm okay. going to deal with the civil rights okay. era in the, in the book that's coming up Good. whenever I finish it. Good. I don't know. Okay. Who knows? And, and so, so we, we will just leave that alone. I, I don't want to go. It is down. coming and it is good. Uh, I hope so. Well, I, yes. I, like I said, I, I just think you're a great lady and a great writer. And so, so there we are, but, but I'm wondering about that because, and I don't want to go too political because, because that's not what we're about either. But, but I just am curious because I look at our world and I look at our culture. I look at where we are as a society. I look at kids. I mean, I have a middle schooler myself and kids are mean. Not only are kids mean, but but they just are so judgmental to things they don't understand. And I, I just wonder, how how are you being a voice to kind of combat that? Well, um, I have several ways of doing it. One is by, I spend a lot of time talking to teachers and trying to help them um, walk through a school day and a school year. Because it is not like it was when I was a teacher. When I was a teacher... Uh, they said, here's your classroom. I closed the door and I taught my students and I did a wonderful job. I said the clean version of what I did, but I was really, really good at what I did as a teacher. And I taught and I included, you know, elements from history and from literature and from art and from poetry and all of that into my English classroom. Schools have changed. Rules have changed. Laws have changed. The focus of schools has changed, and they've made it very, very difficult for teachers, very, very difficult for uh, schools to be successful, for students to be successful. They can't blame it on the students because it's coming from way higher up. So I'm planning on being the next secretary of education, by the way. I just thought I'd let you know that. Are we announcing a campaign right now? No, I don't need a campaign. They they just need to call me when it's time. (laughs) Sounds good. I shall be the next secretary of education because I understand and I think I can fix it. 
But Sharon, I'm I'm wondering about that, and so I'm I'm going to take you down a little bit of a, a a side road if if you'll allow. I grew up in a public school education around the fourth grade for me. I had a teacher. Her name was Mrs. Haggerty or Miss Haggerty. Uh, I don't know where she is now. Uh, so who knows if she'll ever hear this? I don't know. But in fourth grade, she had in her mind thought I had dyslexia. There were some signs that she kind of started picking up on. There were things. And again, I don't know what they were. I actually called my mom this morning. So love you, mom. Thanks for the help um, to ask her because I don't remember. All I remember is being shipped off to you know, a, a side room where they tested me uh, for dyslexia and IEP and, and evaluating that and all that. But I remember going to a resource room the next year in fifth grade it was the first time I had been pulled away from my, my peers. And I just remember how demoralizing that was, how mm-hmm. isolated I felt. And uh, in a lot of respects, when I'm reading Melanie's, uh, Melody's story about being in, in the in the room that she's in with her other, you know, we'll say peers or people of, mm-hmm. of her um, challenged students. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know right where you to say that, but we'll just leave it at challenged students. But but I remember feeling that way myself, and I'm being totally candid here. I wept during certain portions of that book because even though I have never struggled with the ability to communicate, some wish that I would because I probably communicate too much <laughs> at times, but I've, I've never not had my voice. Uh-huh. But I have struggled with reading, writing, spelling, uh, you know, all of it. And, uh-huh. and I just wonder, are, are teachers today, and, and again, I know you've, you've not taught for a while, but I know you're in schools all the time. How, how would you suggest, you know, teachers combat that, that dyslexia, that isolation, that, you know? Uh, it, it goes back to personalization. And it, we have to remove schools from standardization and go back to personalization. Uh, standardization does not work. Uh, all kids learn differently at different times and in different ways. And back when I was in school, teachers were free to figure that out and assign what was necessary for the students in their care. And they did it without anybody from above um, dictating, this is what you must do. Uh, we have become just overwhelmed with testing. Testing doesn't do anything except. Um, show that a a child or a school or a teacher has succeeded or not succeeded. It has nothing to do with learning at all. And so that's why I'm going to be Secretary of Education, because we need to bring back common sense to the educational system. So just give me time. I'll I'll get there. (laughs) I love it. I really do. I'm ready to... Really, I'm ready to move you know, to Washington. And, I'm going to do it. I, and, and Sharon, this is what's so fascinating to me about you is the fact that you just have this vision of this is what I'm going to do and this is how I'm going to do it. And and I love that. I respect that about people tremendously because <laughs> I, I, I mean it. I'm being sincere. When well, I, say I don't that. know how I'm going to do it, well, but I do talk about it a lot. And I'm not joking. No, I, know, because... I don't believe you are. <laughs> Because there is a there is a, a huge need to to improve and change and heal. That's probably the best word. American education. It needs to be healed. It's broken and it needs to be healed. It's not broken beyond repair, but it needs to be healed. And um, we need people like me who are loving and caring and remember what it's like to be in a nurturing classroom and not have fear and dread for going to school. So we have to move on beyond that. But that's, I'm, I am very strongly an advocate for American schools. And we just need somebody who can get in there and make a difference. So well, I, I'm available. I, you just put the word out that we'll, we'll help when you, they're we'll looking help you, for a we'll secretary help you get of education. The word out. Absolutely. We'll help I'm you get available. the word out. We will yes. help you get the word out for sure. So I, I want to go back to, you know, you as a teacher, because I'm thinking back even to my educational, you know, uh, journey as, as I was getting ready for the show today. I was thinking about that, like in my 13 years of, of education, counting kindergarten as, as the 13, I think I had four teachers that stand out to me that really See? believed in me, that really yep. pushed me forward, that really challenged me to be better than what I was. I do remember I had an English teacher my sophomore year and we had to give speeches in in school, you know, like every English Mm -hmm. class. Right. And uh, this is a terrible story. (laughs) But 
but we had to give a speech, right? And the speech had to be written out. And then we gave it, it was a five to 10 minute speech. And so I get up and I give my speech and, and it's awesome. And, and the, the teacher says to me, you know, this is better than my honors students. That tells you kind of what kind of English class I was in. I was not in an honors English class. Uh, but she said, this is better than my honors students. Will you come back next period to give this speech again? Wow. And, I, and I said, uh, you know, I don't I don't really feel comfortable with that. I, You know, I'm really kind of shy and timid, which if you know me is not at all close to accurate in any shape, form or fashion. And so she says, well, let me just read it. And before I can grab the paper, she snatches it from my hand off my oh. desk. And on the paper is just squiggly lines. There was nothing written. I had done it all from memory. Oh, wow. And she (laughs) was blown away first. Changed my A to a B because I didn't follow the assignment because the assignment was, of course, to write it To write a speech. Right. And I did not. I had memorized enough information from, I think it was Howard Cosell, to to be honest with you. Uh, But I had memorized enough of his story and remembered enough from you know, the book to basically put together a decent speech. And so she was very mad at that. And then after class, I had to stay, of course. And she said, how are you able to do that? And I said, well, I I just have an incredible memory for memorizing things. And I've noticed that and I've really, you know, tapped into that. Yeah. And she said, uh, that's incredible. Not everyone can do that. And I said, no, no, everyone can do that. I'm, I'm not anything special. Everyone can do that. And she said, no, 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 you don't understand. Not everyone can do that. And so, you know, as a teacher, you know, if a student had done that, I'm curious, can I, can I tap into that teacher resource for a moment? How would you have reacted that way? Not putting this teacher on blast because we're going to leave her name out of this story, but, but how I- would you have reacted to that? I would have praised the teacher. Um, I mean, I would have praised if I were your teacher at yeah. that moment. You're, I would you're my have praised you. English teacher. Yeah. I would have praised you for what you had done. I would have said, "Okay, I want you to write it out so I have something to look at in my book." But clearly, you have under you understood. If the purpose of the assignment was to give an oral presentation, you succeeded. So I would praise you for for your success, praise you for your ability to talk without any notes at all. And then I said, just so I have something to grade, scribble something out and give it to me. But you're good, you know, Uh, because that's what we do. We we teach children or we're supposed to teach children individually. So your skill was to be able to speak and run your mouth without actually writing anything down. Clearly, you had studied because you knew your your quotes from Howard Cosell or whatever. You so you were you were prepared for it. But we students learn differently, and we cannot put a standardized type of teaching and learning on students who are not standardized. We all have different ways of learning and expressing ourselves. So um, I, I would have praised you for what you did and thought it was pretty clever that you were able to do it that effectively. <laughs> well, it's kind of formed a bad habit in my mind because a lot of times Garrett always teases me that we'll show up for to do an interview such as today and a lot of times I don't have notes and he's blown away by the fact that we're able to carry on a conversation with, with no notes today. I do have notes. So, uh, in, well, in full disclosure, I give, so I give presentations all the time. I give speeches all the time. I can give a one hour presentation with no notes at all and not repeat myself. And people will give me a rousing applause when I get finished. I can do it. Um, I generally write stuff down, I, I, but I don't write out speeches. I just write down like high points, like, you know, talk about Secretary of Education, talk about the sky, talk about, you know, I'll give myself ideas and I'll focus on the purpose of the presentation. So like if it's the American Library Association, I will mention my connection to libraries and my affection for libraries and librarians. And that's going to be important in this next book because a large part of it takes place in a library. So that kind of thing. So I jot down notes about what I'm going to say, but I'd never write out a speech word for word. So I got a quote that I came across that I think uh, maybe encompasses your passion, not only for writing, but obviously you being a a visionary that you are. And that's this is uh, and I'm curious to know your thoughts on it. When we learn, we teach. When we get, we give. Hmm. Did I say that? You didn't, actually. Oh, oh, I thought that I said, is that one of my speeches? <laughs> no, I, okay, no, I'm starting was, to forget uh, things. Maybe was, I uh, never. 
That was uh, Myra Angelou. A- Angelou. My Angelou. Yeah. My Angelou. Yeah. 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 She said that. Okay. So when you learn, you teach. When you yes. get, you give. What are your thoughts yes. on that? That's the essence of what a teacher is. A teacher is always a learner. Um, because you learn with your students, you learn along with your students, you learn because of your students. I remember I taught ninth grade one year and I had a student who came in and she was without a doubt the best writer that I had ever encountered in all my years of teaching. She was so exceedingly ahead of everybody else. I felt like I had nothing to teach her. She was that good. So I, um, so I had to challenge myself to find ways to teach her. She was 14. There were still things she needed to learn, but she was so far ahead of all the rest of the kids. So I had to find things to challenge her. So I became a better teacher by helping her to learn. You think that's really the key is, is that maybe we're not passing on to the next generation, the excitement and the passion about learning? Well, the way that the educational system is set up, they have removed all passion and excitement from learning. And I'll just stop right there until I become secretary (laughs) of education and I can fix that. Oh, I absolutely love that. That is so fun. Um, so I, I know you've said in, in a, a number of interviews that you've given and, and maybe even a number of talks that you've given that you do receive letters from time to time from readers, right? Yes. Okay. So uh, hardest letter that you've ever received and why? Um, the letters that that talk about their the pain and the trauma of real life human beings. I write about fictional people. I make people up. None, none of my characters are real. And none of them are based on anybody real that I know. But when I get a letter from somebody that says, I read your book and I could identify with this character because I was abused or because um, I was, you know, I was hurt as a child or because my parents were divorced, uh, then those hit me hard because I have reached them because they are at a world where. They're at a place in the world where where they 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 are in pain and they identify with something that I have written because of the pain. So that I try my best to make sure that I'm I reach out to them and I can't fix them, but at least say words of encouragement to them. That that's incredible to me that you can tap into that feelings for people and that you can draw that kind of raw, real reaction from them as an author. I mean, what, what, what kind of goes through your mind when you hear those stories and when you hear that kind of, kind of retelling of things? Well, I think because I was a teacher first and because I understand the nature of a 12 year old or a 13 year old or a 15 year old, I understand at the gut level what it's like to be an adolescent. And so uh, their devices may have changed. They, you know, they all have cell phones and they all have Instagram and they all have things that I don't even know exist and (laughs) they use all the time. But the essence of being 12 or 14 or 16 has not changed. The feelings inside a human person as they're trying to grow and develop and figure out who they are in the world how they deal with friendships, how they deal with the opposite sex, how they deal with parents. Uh, That hasn't changed. So that's what I try to focus on when I'm writing is the essence of 12, the essence of 14 and what it's like to be 14. It has nothing to do with the kind of shoes that you wear. It's the, the person that you are on the inside and how you are coping through life from day one to day two to day whatever, 300 of the, of the school year. So if you could go back in time and talk to your 12 year old self, what would you tell him? What would you tell yourself at 12? I would tell myself to keep on reading, uh, keep on going to the library and start writing sooner. That's pretty, succinct. I didn't, that was pretty succinct. Yeah. I mean, just like, okay, I would do yeah. this. I would do this. I would do because this. 
Would your, was would your 12-year-old self listen, though? Yeah, I think I would. Because it didn't occur to me that I could be a writer until I had been a teacher for a long time. So if anything, I would have started writing sooner. But maybe I had to live long enough and see enough and experience enough to have something to say. You know, uh, I had a young lady come to me once and say, ah, I just wrote a book. I said, how old are you? I'm 12. Wonderful. And I'm going to get, my mother is going to publish 800 copies of it and we're going to sell it. Good, sweetie. That's wonderful. I'm proud of you. But that was not me. And 12 is probably too soon. It happens. And there's, you know, the, the student authors that that make it and are successful. But generally, you have to live a while so that you can write something of some depth that's going to be a lasting piece of literature. And so I guess I would tell my 12-year-old self to keep on reading, do what you're doing, except focus on writing a little bit earlier. That's the only thing I would change. Wow. I, I don't know what I would ever tell my 12-year-old self. Probably just stop being a knucklehead, maybe. I don't yeah, know. Hang that's in awesome. There. That's awesome that you could go back and do that. So uh, I had a couple uh, uh, friends of the show and uh, and even uh, actually a really big fan of, the, of our show. And, and uh, I emailed her this last week and I said, hey, you know, we're going to have you on. And, and I, I asked her if she would come up with a question that, that she would like to have asked. And so this is actually from, from one of our fans of the show. And that's this is so this isn't even my question, by the way. So so there we are. Okay. Uh, she says, uh, where does your value come from? And then, uh, what value do you see in writing books? Uh, and, and why do you think readers take so much away from your writing? So that was kind of a, a big question, but, That's but three where, questions. yeah, where do you find your value of course? And then, uh, and then why do you find value in writing the books and, and that readers take so much away? Um, I don't know where, I don't know. I don't know how to answer the question about where do I find my value? Um, I appreciate myself. I'm proud of myself. Um, I'm not afraid to talk about myself or um, or put myself and my feelings and my emotions in a story. So I don't know if that's value or not, but that's and that's a long thing. As you get older, you learn to value yourself and you learn that, you know, that you are unique and that there's nobody else in the world exactly like you. So I, you know. I value myself as much as I possibly can uh, without getting the big head because, you know, one of your kids will smack you upside your head and tell you to get over yourself, Mom. Uh, and then what was the second part of the question? Yeah, so the second part is uh, where do you see the value in writing books? Oh, okay. And, uh, and why do you want readers and – what, and what value do you want readers to take away? Uh, again, the takeaway part, I really don't care what value readers take away. You take away whatever you want, whatever you can. Every single human who reads a book will get something different from it, and that's the way it's supposed to be. If we all got the same thing from every single book, then we would all be robots and we would need literature. So uh, every person that comes to a book gets something different. Somebody will read a page and say, oh, wow, that was beautiful. And somebody else says, that was no big deal. You know, and it, because when you read a book, you connect your own personal experiences to the words on the page. So when I read somebody else's book, I'm going, oh, man, that's I never thought about that. I never realized. Oh, wow. That description that she made is just magnificent. So I like to read because I like I learn so much about what other people have put in books. When people read what I have written, they get to take whatever they want from it. And every if I pass the book out to a class of 35 children and each one of those people read the book, each one of them would have a different thing that they took from it. And that's the way it's supposed to be. We all should get personalized responses to literature. And there is no right answer. There is no one answer to uh, what did you get from the book? This is what I got from the book. And so that's why that book is meaningful to me. 
and and if I have a discussion with you and you say this is what you get out of the book, say, oh wow, I never thought about that. You're right. And then we have a conversation. Again, that's a good classroom technique where you get to have those kinds of discussions with students. Yeah, I I think I think that's uh, I love a lot of what you're saying there because I think again you may look at a I'm just going to use a sun sunrise as, a, as an example, but you could look at a sunrise and go, oh yeah, I've seen that before, no big thing. But I could look at it and think it's the most you know majestic, beautiful thing I've ever seen yes. in my life, right? It's, yes. It is so very subjective, for sure. And both are valid. And if we're going to have a discussion about sunrises, then I'll say what I thought about it, and you'll say what you thought about it, and both of us are changed because we've had a discussion about the sunrise. Yeah, for sure. That's what reading is. And I think that's the, the other thing, too. I think that we're missing a lot of times in society is the fact of having this conversation, that you can be right, I can be right, and we can both look at the same thing, you know? Maybe I'm exactly. wrong on that, but... But that's how I feel, too. So. That's what opinion is. Opinion is just personal reaction to uh, a stimulus, uh, whether it's a sunrise or a sunset or a, a line of, of poetry in a book. OK, so uh, here's another question. Um, have these books changed your identity with your uh, family or friends at all? Uh, not to my family. They all say <laughs> Wow, mom, you wrote another book? That's cool. That's kind They're of... They're so just <laughs> passive about it? Are you kidding yeah. me? They're just like, oh, yeah, yeah. out of my They're... mind's been translated 20 times. Big deal, mom. Way to go. Gold yeah. start. That's I'm, it? Are you kidding? I'm, You're joking, I'm, right? I'm, I'm mom. And so they're very proud of me. And they, But it's I'm mom first. I'm not this writer that, that walks on stage with a spotlight. You know, where I'm wearing a, a, a very nice suit and my comfortable shoes. <laughs> I'm mom. And so that's two different people. Sharon Draper, the writer and the author and the speaker and the world traveler, is a very different person than Sharon Draper, the mom. I'm just mom. So they appreciate me. They admire me. They're very proud of me. But ultimately, I'm just mom. And that's the way it should be. I'm laughing at that. I really am. That's... <laughs> So funny to me, but but friends of yours too. Well, let me let me Go give ahead. you an example. Give me an I example. Was, yeah, I was sitting in a uh, in a, my daughter's school, and she was I think eighth grade, and I was at the school for something, and and we were sitting there together, and one of her friends came by and said, "Oh my goodness, that's Sharon Draper." And so the the my daughter says, "Yeah, that's my mom." She says, "You live with Sharon Draper." And she says, yeah, it's no big deal. She makes me make my bed. <laughs> you know, it's like, so I'm mom, you know. And yes, she was proud of me. And yes, she was sitting on the front row. And yes, she was the first person to cheer, you know, when I was finished. But her friend was like, oh, oh my goodness, you live with Sharon Draper. And she was like, no, I live with mom. And that's who I am to my family. I'm mom. That's funny. That's so funny to me. <laughs> It's probably she makes more me, realistic. She than makes me make else. my bed. That was the part I think I, I resonated yeah. with probably more than anything. Yeah. So yeah. that's funny. Um, so before you know, before any great journey, right? Whether you're whether you're going to Egypt or you're going to Africa or even you're starting a new book or, or anytime you're starting a new project, even right? There's this this idea of before you begin any great journey, right? One must count the cost. What has mm -hmm. the cost of writing been for you? Now, I'm not talking about financial costs, and I know there are some, obviously, but I'm more talking about just cost in general. How, how has that played into your story? I suppose it's mostly time and effort and sitting. And, you know, if I'm having a writing day, I don't go do anything else. Um, so it, it hasn't been a a huge personal cost. It's it's what I do. It's like other people, you know, get up and get on the bus and go to work. I get up and go in the room and turn on the computer. It's just what I do. So there, I don't think there's been a cost to it, um, like something negative. It's just it's just it's just what I do. <laughs> and I enjoy it. I get a great deal of satisfaction out of it. I agonize over it, every little word. And then my editor goes over every little word again. And oh, she's very, very thorough. Is there, red, but, is there a red pen involved in the editing ooh, process, by the way? I, I just am curious. It's green. Oh, it's green. Hers okay. is green. Okay. Because I'm, I'm, I'm thinking as a teacher, you know, that that might be why I hate the color red to this day is because I yeah. saw it so often on papers and circled and underlined and whatever. Yeah. 
Hers, hers is, is green. green. Okay. Yeah. All right. But um, um, we have been, I've been with the same editor for many years, so uh, we understand each other. And uh, she is extremely, extremely uh, minutely dedicated to detail. And editing is not fixing commas and capital letters. Editing is saying things like, uh, you have mentioned her four times in this chapter and you have not said anything about what she thinks. All you have said is what she's wearing. Add more about what she's thinking on this page. Those kinds of things, you know, where she gives me suggestions and corrections that has to do with the essence of the text. Um, there's a there's another editor called a copy editor that fixes commas and capital letters. She fixes the essence of things. Or like she'll say, all right, chapter two ends with the sunset. And chapter three starts Thursday morning. You've missed four days. What's going on here? Can you make it smoother, the transition between chapter two and chapter three? Those kind of things. I need that. I need somebody like that for oh, me. Oh, she's very good. <laughs> She's hard, but she's good. I've thought about writing really a book too. Uh, I've I've had a couple of book ideas through the years, but uh, I don't know if I'm I'm ready for that yet. So, um, uh, so Sharon, as, as we kind of try to 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 wrap up, um, I'm curious about this. Do you have of 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 the books that you have done? Do you have a favorite? No. And if I did, I wouldn't tell you. Come on. <laughs> No, you don't. Have, you don't really depends. have a favorite. I, I figured you probably didn't, but I just thought I'd no, ask. No, anyway. I really, I really don't. It just depends on on who I'm talking to, or who the audience is, or uh, the need of the group that I'm speaking to, uh, or that I'm writing for. So no, I don't have a favorite. It's like um, you know, I have four children. I can't tell you which one is my favorite. You know, it's it's you can't do that. It's like. We, uh, Garrett and I were on a show, uh, yeah. in the past. It's probably aired by now. Uh, if it hasn't, well, we'll get on the people, but, but we were on a show recently, another podcast, and, uh, we were asked the question, what our favorite episode was. And I'm like stumbling. And so Garrett chimes in first. And of course, he's very eloquent and says how great it is and all this stuff. And then they go, and you, Neil, what's your favorite? And I'm like, I, I, I don't know. I really am stuck. I mean, we've put out, you know, 50 some odd episodes and to narrow down to just one, I'm like, I, I can. And I think I named three. I might have named four. I'm not sure. But it is hard when you when you put time and effort into a project or, or you right. know, a presentation. It's hard to pick one. And I knew that was kind of a throwaway question. But I thought, well, maybe maybe she has one. So, yeah. uh, so I want to, I want to end with this and then we're going to play a game. I'm curious about this one too. How do you want to be remembered? I want to be remembered as somebody who wrote books that were meaningful, that changed the lives or changed the minds or changed the thoughts of the young person who was reading it. Wow. I mean, do you wake up? Every morning thinking when you're starting a new book or you're maybe you're in the middle of a book, because you, as you alluded to, you kind of are in the middle of a book. Um, do you wake up with that idea that this is going to change somebody's life? No, I wake up and say, oh, my goodness, I haven't finished chapter 12 yet. <laughs> no. I love your humor. I really do. You're so funny to me. I'm like trying to like mute my laughter right now, but it's really hard. No, it's... Um... It, that's really honest, you know. I if people who have grandiose feelings about themselves and their importance to the world of literature are very quietly and quickly humbled because there's already always somebody else who's going to write something better, something bigger, something fancier, something more powerful than what you have ever thought of. And that's just the nature of the thing. I'm just glad that we still have books, that they are still publishing books, that people are still reading books. I'm a real strong supporter of the public library, um, that it is important that we have um, libraries where people can go and read for free. Um, wow, that's that's fascinating stuff to me, uh, Sharon. Uh, really, really great stuff there. So uh, I do have one more question that popped in my head, the joy of, 
of me and, and how my brain works. And that's this idea of when your story's finished, and I know we kind of already talked about this, you know, being remembered and all of that. I, I just think you're going to be the one of those game changers that people talk about. At least that's my hope is, is that as an author, you really have changed so many lives. And I, I wonder so many times, do you think that has anything to do with your bringing up and your background or any of that? Do you think any of that leads into, leads into your story at all? Um, probably yes and no. Um, you know, I, I grew up in a time where I experienced a lot of things that I wasn't aware of at the time, because when you're a child, you're not aware of all the social nuances that were going on. And so I am able now to go back, like the book I'm working on now, uh, takes place in the civil rights era. And because now I can look back on it with some sort of, uh, knowledge and sophistication. But when you're a kid, you're not aware of that. You're only supposed to be 12 when you're 12. You're not thinking of the future or your mark on the world. You're just thinking about getting to be 13. And that's, you know, that's the, that's what it's supposed to be. So I look at what I have done and I'm proud of what I have been able to do. And I hope that I can write more. I've got some more things to say because the older I get, the more I have um, the ability to make comments about what's going on in the world or what used to go on in the world, what is still going on in the world. Yeah, I, I do. I, th I think that's so fascinating. And, and Sharon, you've been great today. We really appreciate you giving us some moments today uh, from your home in uh, Cincinnati. I did make a Bengals reference. Are, are you a Sports fan at all of the Bengals? We'll we'll close with that. Um, I I love the Bengals because I like orange and black. They're my favorite colors. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> We're not going to talk about their, their football yeah. record. But, well, uh, you know what? I don't think they won, but that's okay. That's okay, right? <laughs> it's okay. That's, that's all right. okay. So we're going to play this game. We play this game. It's called Senseless. It's uh, it's really just kind of our nonsense game to kind of wrap up the show with. So uh, since you're not here, Garrett is going to be your uh, proxy roller. So he's going to roll on your place. And so we uh, here we go. Garrett's going to roll for you. And you got a – oh, I was really hoping you were going to get this number – Number six. Thank you okay. for uh, putting that out there. Uh, so here we go. Number six uh, is this. Um, dinner. They're buying. You can choose the restaurant, but they're buying. They're picking up the check. So so money's no object. Uh, you're going to dinner with one person, dead or alive. Who would it be and why? Denzel Washington. No hesitation. There wasn't even a thought. There was just, it's Denzel. Now, Denzel I, Washington. I kind of know some reasons why, but what are your reasons why? Um, I think he's a very talented actor. Um, I admire the fact that of all the Hollywood couples, you don't ever see anything about he and his wife breaking up or you know, having divorces or running off with somebody else. It's a family man. So um, it would be Denzel Washington. If Denzel was busy, it would be Barack Obama. Okay. Now I'm curious about Barack. Why Why Mr. Obama or President, former President Obama? Um, I met him once. He doesn't remember, but I do. Um, when I was at the White House. Right. You were, you, you've you been there a number of times. You're almost like having your own parking spot. Yeah, I've been there like six, six seven times. I admire him because of his brilliance, his consistency, his uh, skilled leadership, his um, quiet power, and the magnificence that he led this country for eight years. Uh, so, yeah. Actually, I would I would cancel my date with Denzel, too to meet with Barack Obama. Wow. Denzel just got kicked to the curb. I don't think I've ever yeah. thought or yeah. I would ever hear uh, that happen. With, without a doubt, I would say I'm, I'm sorry, Denzel. Oh, I, I would go with Denzel because maybe he could get me a movie deal. But Barack Obama, I would meet because I admire him as the human being that he is. Uh, so I'm going to go back to Denzel just for a quick sec because I'm curious. Uh, do you have a favorite movie that he was in? No, I want him to make a movie of one of my books. Oh, God. <laughs> God okay. Fair enough. Which one would that be? Which one would you like to see into a movie? Any of them. Any of them. Okay. If, any of them. But I think Copper Sun would be a good movie. Okay. Um, uh, and Out of My Mind would be a good movie. I think actually, Out of too. My Mind, Out of My Mind, actually, they have talked about making a movie out of it. They need to. They move, people in Hollywood move very slowly. Yeah. And uh, there are no roller skates in this project, but yeah. they have talked about it. 
Uh, I could see out of my mind in a movie. Uh, I was going to tell you, too, uh, this last summer I got to be a mascot at a baseball game, uh, kind of a fill-in mascot. And so part of the role mm-hmm. as a mascot is you actually can't talk. You can only gesture Ooh. with your arms and, you know, and all of that. And so as I'm reading the book again out of my mind, I'm thinking back to my mascot moment that night. And it was it was in the summer and we out here in Oregon, it gets hot. I mean, it was probably mm-hmm. 105 that night and then you throw on a costume on top of that it was yeah. it was very warm in that suit but my wife said to me what was the hardest part about being in the costume was it the heat and I said no 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 the heat I could handle is not being able to talk was the worst not being able to talk and yeah. she goes maybe you need to be a mascot more often sweetie <laughs> That so, sounds like a wife. <laughs> so if you knew her you would understand that humor that but I know you're like laughing because because she's awesome and she is great yeah. so so uh, anyway, there we are. So uh, Sharon, again, thank you so much uh, for coming on today. Uh, is there anything we can help you promote? I know you didn't come on with that in mind, uh, but I always like to to give you an opportunity to share anything that, that might be coming up or, or anything like that, that we can help kind of get the word out about you and what you're doing. Um, I don't have anything big and huge that I'm getting ready to do, like going to where, you know, everybody come out and see me at the something in New York. I'm not doing any of that right away. Um, um, Blended is the newest baby. We didn't talk about Blended much. We didn't. And I didn't read that one, so that's part of the reason why. Yeah. Okay. Well, you, I'll, I'll, your homework will be to read that with your daughter. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. It's that age. She's how old? Uh, she's 12. She's, uh, oh, she's a seventh grader. And, so uh, is yeah, the, the girl in the grader. book is 12, too. So it's perfect. So your homework, see, I'm still a teacher, is to read Blend It with your daughter and um, and then discuss it with her and tell her and find out what she thinks about uh, the issues in the book. And then you can write me a three page report and it will be due. I'll give you uh, I'll give you a month to turn your paper in. <laughs> All right. I will email it back it's, to you. Can it be double spaced or uh... if you become a teacher, you don't ever forget and never no, lose you it, don't. Do you? No, can I use new couriers so it strengthens out the the uh the pages and all that? Wow, I don't know. No, standard MLA format, dear. Okay, all right. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> Sharon, you're a delight. Oh, you really fun. are. I I, yeah. I cannot tell you thank you so much enough. Uh, you can ask Garrett. Of course, you can't because he doesn't have a microphone. But but I was really nervous about sitting with you and, and even elated and so much excitement as well. Uh, I just wish you all the best uh, in this new year. And I just am so excited, again, uh, that we got an opportunity to sit with a New York Times uh, bestseller. That's something we're excited about sharing. And, and uh, again, I just wish you all the much success with with blended and and then the the future projects coming down the way for you. I'm I'm definitely going to keep following you and and seeing uh, books that you do. I I don't know if I can say I can read the whole uh, catalog, but I'm definitely gonna gonna read uh, my homework. Well, I've only and... assigned I've only assigned one book to you, so you're okay. Well, that's good because I don't know if I can handle <laughs> more than one book. But I am going to do your homework assignment. Uh, I, I feel okay. challenged in that regard, and so I'm going to do that. So with that okay. said, uh, we'll just kind of kind of get on out of here today. So Delightful talking to you. I really, really enjoyed it. Thank you so much, Sharon. <laughs> okay, thanks a lot. And again, this is Other People's Shoes, of course. You know I am your host, Neil Matthews. Thank you so much, Sharon, for joining us today. Wasn't that a delight? I know I've laughed quite a bit. Hopefully you got some uh, chuckles out of that as well. Uh, Of course, you can find out more about her at SharonDraper.com. We, of course, post that in our show notes. But again, just remember, stay tuned for next week. We're on season four. Thank you for joining us. Can't wait till next week when we sit down with another guest. I'm Neil Matthews. And remember, when you walk in other people's shoes, you really do get a different perspective on life. Thank you again, Sharon, and uh, we'll see you next week. I want to thank our guest, Sharon Draper, so much for joining us today. Go check out her book, Blended, Out of My Mind, two great books. We've linked her website down below as well for you to take a look at that. I want to invite you over to OPSpodcast.com. Of course, that is the place for past and present and future episodes. That's where those, of course, will show up. And of course, on your favorite podcast platform. If you'd like to give to the show, of course, Other People's Shoes is a nonprofit tax-deductible entity, so any gift given can be, of course, deducted on your tax.
taxes. So we, of course, have linked some show notes down below on how you can do that if you'd like to do that. Here's a sneak preview of next week's show. Is they love the darkness more than the light. And what I mean by that is they love, and I don't mean dark, ooh, horned devil. I mean, they love the comfort that they have established for their own life. It works for them. And they love that status in their life more than they love the challenge and difficulty of asking why and and pursuing things with your mind. I don't know about you. I am so excited to sit with our guest next week. He's an author. He's a speaker. He's a YouTuber. He's just doing all kinds of stuff out in the state of Utah. So stay tuned for that. That'll take place, of course, on Wednesday. If you would like to interact with the show, we, of course, have four ways to be able to do that. You can call us and text us at 203-548-7463. That's 203 Three five four eight seven four six three. Of course, for questions and feedback can be done at that number. You can also like us, follow us, and tweet us at OPS Podcast Show. All of our social medias now have that name and recognition. Remember, when you walk in other people's shoes, you really do get a different perspective on life. On behalf of Garrett and myself, we'll see you on Wednesday when we sit down with our guest. Until then, have a great week.